Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today I'm going to be going over the uh, Microeconomics Set 2 for the FRQ of 2023. And uh, I don't work for the College Board and I don't know what the rubric is going to end up saying. This is an unboxing video. That means that these questions were just released a few hours ago. I've done the best I could to go through and figure out what I think the best answers are. Um, and we'll see if the rubric agrees with me when they come out. Um, until then, uh, this is what I think. So we'll find out though later. Uh, before we get into it, I wanna thank you for the support of, review, of ReviewEcon.com over the last year. Uh, if you have any friends that are going to be taking micro or macroeconomics next year, make sure you let them know about uh, ReviewEcon.com, the YouTube channel, the games, and all that stuff. I really appreciate the support. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. Let's uh, see the first question. We have Anderson Company. It's a typical firm that produces uh, good X. They have a constant cost, perfectly competitive market, and they are earning positive economic profits. Uh, first thing we need to know is, or identify is, what must be true about the relationship between accounting profit and economic profit if this company has both explicit and implicit costs. As you should already be aware, as long as there are some implicit costs of production, then accounting profit is going to be greater than economic profit. And that's because accounting profit is revenue minus explicit costs and economic profit is accounting profit minus implicit costs. So we are just subtracting one more thing, and as long as the implicit costs exist, then economic profit is going to be less than accounting profit. All right, on to the next part. We're going to draw a graph for this company, side-by-side -side graph, so it's actually two graphs. We have to have the market price and quantity and the firm price and quantity, as well as the area of economic profit for the firm. So here we go, it's just a perfectly competitive market and firm with a profit and having that profit shaded. So we have our uh, market over there with the price and quantity marked and the ATC must be below the demand curve at the MR equals MC quantity labeled QF right there. And that gap between the average total cost and the average revenue all the way to the axis is how we find our profit or economic profit. All right, on to the next part. On your graph in part B, uh, so the graph we just drew, you're gonna graph it on there. Uh, show what would happen to each of the following if the market for good G adjusts to a long run equilibrium. Uh, the market price and quantity, we were, are going to label it P2 and Q2 respectively, and the firm's uh, profit maximizing price and quantity also. So once we have a long run adjustment, remember we have an increase in the supply because firms are going to enter the market seeking that profit. That drives the price from the market down to the minimum of the average total cost curve for the firm. So we have a lower Mr. Darp there at a lower quantity as well. You'll notice that the uh, new Mr. Darp is below the old profit box. That is one key thing that they will be looking for, I expect. You gotta see daylight is what we refer to it as, is what I refer to it as, uh, underneath that profit box. So we should see the minimum of the ATC popping out below. Common mistake is to shade all the way down to the new Mr. Darp, and that's not correct. All right, there we go. There's the answer for, for all of C. All right, moving on to D. Uh, we're going to assume that the production of the good creates benefits to third parties. Given this situation, will the market equilibrium quantity be greater than, less than, or equal to the allocatively efficient quantity? And we need to explain. So uh, here's my explanation. It's going to be less than. And the reason why is because when there is a positive externality, that's what this is indicating here, then at that market quantity, the marginal social benefit is going to be greater than the marginal social cost. All right, and, uh, and we're gonna have dead weight loss as a, re as a result because we are uh, going to be um, underproducing, or excuse me, overproducing. No, underproducing <laughs> because it's a positive externality. Yeah, underproducing. All right, here we go. Moving on to the next part. Uh, the government takes action to, that corrects for the externality in the market for good G. As a result uh, of the government's actions, does economic surplus increase, decrease, or stay the same? And we have to explain. I must admit, I had trouble with this one because I don't know exactly how much they're going to want me to explain. I didn't want to write a dissertation on this thing, but essentially the government is going to be paying a per unit subsidy for this good. 
uh, that per unit subsidy, the expense of that actually needs to be subtracted from the new amounts of consumer and producer surplus. Um, now deadweight loss is eliminated as well. So I didn't know exactly how to explain all of it. So here's what I did. I don't know uh, if I did way too much. I don't know if I hit all the points that they're going to want. So take this answer with a grain of salt. I'm least confident on this one we're about to see. So here is, here's what I put. Increase, I do, I do believe that's correct. Uh, because, it's the because, the explain point, I'm not 100% sure I'm gonna get it, but uh, the quantity will increase, the, uh, the price uh, consumers pay will decrease, and the price sellers receive will increase. Consumer surplus increases, producer surplus increases, deadweight loss is eliminated, and the increase in consumer and producer surplus will outweigh the subsidy expense to the government. That's a lot. <laughs> so I don't know. That's a lot. But I think I hit it all. I think I talked way too much. I don't think they'll require all this, but I'm not exactly sure where they're going to draw the line here. So uh, we'll see. We'll see when the rubric comes out. All right. On to the next part. Keep dry produces uh, and sells rain jackets in a perfectly competitive product market. Price is $5 per jacket. They hire all of their workers in, uh, in a perfectly competitive market also and they pay those workers $15. Labor is the only variable input we've got. So here is our production function. Here it is. And first we need to calculate the marginal revenue product of the second worker. So we are looking at just the change in the total product between the first and second worker. We go from nine units of output to 20 units of output. That is 11 units of marginal product. We then take that marginal product, times it by the price of the product of $5, and that gives us $55 of marginal revenue product here, right? And technically marginal revenue product is the marginal revenue times the marginal product, but since they're selling into a perfectly competitive firm, the price is that marginal revenue. All right. Moving on to the next part, diminishing returns will begin with the hiring of which worker? Remember, diminishing returns occurs when the marginal product begins to decrease. So that second worker has a marginal product of 11 units and we went from zero to nine, so we're rising, it's increasing, but that next worker, the third worker, we have a marginal product of seven units because we go from 20 to 27. So it is less than the 11 marginal product that we got for unit for the second worker. So it's on that third worker that diminishing marginal returns sets in. On to the next part, determine the profit maximizing number of workers the firm should hire. Explain using marginal analysis. This is going to be tricky for a lot of people because you have to not only, at least historically, they put the bar where you not only have to explain why the profit maximizing quantity is that profit maximizing quantity, but you also have to explain why the next unit would not be appropriate. So it is four units. Right, because that fourth worker has a marginal revenue product of $25, it's five units of marginal product times the $5, that's $25, and that worker costs $15 to hire, that's the marginal resource cost. That's the fourth worker. But the marginal revenue product of the fifth worker, we go from 32 units to 34 units times the $5, that is $10 of marginal revenue product, and that is less than the marginal revenue product of fifth or the marginal resource cost or the factor cost of $15, which is the wage of the fifth worker. So that first fifth worker, you're actually going to lose $5 profit, but that fourth worker, you actually increase profit by 10 bucks. All right. So that's why it's four workers. All right. Moving on to the next part. We're going to assume that keep dry's fixed cost is $40 and we're going to calculate keep dry's economic profit when hiring the mat profit maximizing number of workers. All right. So, and we're going to show our work. So as we just found out, we have uh, four workers that are going to be hired. That means they are going to be producing 32 units of output for four workers. We times that by the $5 of, of marginal revenue, which gives us $160 of, of total revenue, or it's $5 price, gives us $160 of total revenue. Then we have a fixed cost of $40 and a variable cost of $60. It's the four workers times the $15 each of them is paid, that's $60. Now we're going to take our profit, we'll be equaling the total revenue of $160 minus the fixed cost of $40, then minus the $60 of variable costs, bringing us to $60 of of profit, economic profit in this case. All right, 
Moving on to the next part. We're going to assume that their fixed cost increases to $80. Will the profit maximizing number of workers hired in the short run increase, decrease, or stay the same? And we have to explain. Well, the answer is going to be stay the same. And that's because hiring workers is always based on marginal analysis. The fixed costs are sunk costs and they aren't relevant to our current decision making. So the answer here is stay the same because changing fixed costs does not change the marginal revenue product of workers or the marginal resource, marginal factor, cost of those workers or the wage. All right. And so since they hire as long as MRP is greater than or equal to MRC, uh, neither one of those changed. The profit maximizing number is not going to change either. On to the next part. Now we've got a graph to analyze again. We had one of these for set one as well. This time it's a monopoly graph or a natural monopoly actually. The graph shows the uh, all of the different parts. Is the firm a in this graph a natural monopoly? Explain. Well, the answer is it is a natural monopoly. This is actually how I like to draw the natural monopolies. This is my favorite way to draw it. There's a few different ways. Uh, but yes, because the average total cost constantly decreases. Officially, it's decreasing through the relevant range. Basically, it's decreasing through the allocatively efficient quantity. Uh, and, and this firm will always have economies of scale as a result. Right, so that means it's a natural monopoly. I believe referencing the ATC constantly downward sloping is all you'll need here. All right, on to the next part. Assume the labeling from the graph. We're using the labeling from the graph. We're going to identify the area representing the dead weight loss for this profit maximizing monopoly. We remember this uh, monopoly is going to produce where MR equals MC. That's a quantity of two right there. Uh, and then they price all the way at the demand curve. And the productively, the allocatively efficient spot is where price equals demand or mar excuse me, where price equals marginal cost or the marginal cost equals demand. So uh, we go at from quantity two, go up till you hit the marginal cost of that quantity. That's at point F. Go all the way up till you hit the marginal benefit of that quantity. That's the demand curve at point B. And then you find the allocatively efficient point where MR where uh, marginal benefit equals marginal cost, not MR. Marginal benefit is the demand curve, so that's at point G. So we've got a triangle of F, B, G. That is the triangle of dead weight loss. I decided not to shade it up here. I think you can find it. All right, moving on to the next part. In order to improve resource allocation, the government sets a price that results in the firm earning zero economic profit. This is called the fair return price. And the fair return price is where the average total cost equals the demand curve. And we are going to identify the price and quantity there. So the uh, average total cost equals the demand curve at the quantity of three and the price of three. You can see it on the graph there. Just identify those quantities. All right, that is the fair return price ceiling price is what that means. All right. Will this government policy eliminate dead weight loss? We're going to explain using numbers. Well, is that the allocatively efficient quantity? No, it's the fair return price, right? So there is still going to be some dead weight loss. So the answer is no, because the socially optimal quantity is at Q4, where MC equals D. At the quantity of three, the price is going to be greater than the marginal cost, and the triangle of C, J, G is the new dead weight loss. I don't think you have to write all of that, but, uh, but some of it will be required, I'm sure. All right, I believe saying at Q3, price is greater than marginal cost will probably be enough. All right, um, although they might want you to have the area of dead weight loss. I don't know exactly where they're gonna put the bar. Is that what that's what it tells me. I'm not sure, but you definitely need to use some labels from that graph in order to uh, answer the question, for sure. All right, moving on to the next part. Instead, the government decides to set a price that results in the socially optimal quantity of output. Will the firm earn positive, negative, or zero economic profit? And we're going to explain, again, using those labels. Remember, the allocatively efficient quantity is at point G there. That is a quantity of four, Q4 there, and the price at is at marginal cost there at P1. But at that price quantity combo at point G, you'll notice that the average total cost curve is greater than that point. So that firm is going to be earning negative economic profits as a result because the average total cost curve is above the demand curve at the socially optimal quantity of Q4. And they will have an economic loss that is equal to the rectangle of P2, P1, G, D, right? And when it comes to all of these graphs, 
uh, referencing the labels, you could actually do it mathematically. I don't do it that way. I find that a much more difficult. Uh, math is not the strongest uh, subject for me, but I'm great at the micro and macro. <laughs> so, so, but I, you could do it mathematically also, but uh, I'm just finding the areas of those rectangles. All right, so there we go. And that's the end of it, all right? Uh, that's that's the end of the of set two. Again, these are my best guesses. We'll find out when the rubrics are released. Um, again, thank you so much for so your support of ReviewEcon.com. Tell your friends about ReviewEcon.com. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to like and subscribe. And thanks a lot. See you all next time.